fact or fiction. CLL, brought to you by the Patient Empowerment Network. Let's talk about symptoms a little bit more. Here are a few things that we've heard from CLL patients. Are these fact or fiction? I shouldn't travel if I have CLL since I may get an infection. I think that is fiction. So I've heard this too. And um, the way I like to think about it is if you're expected to live with CLL for a very long time, you had better go out and do the things you want to do. You know, this is not supposed to keep you a prisoner in your house. Now, if you're in the middle of starting some sort of more intensive treatment for it or less intensive treatment, but you started it last week, that is not a good time to go somewhere where there's no hospitals in the middle of the Pacific Ocean or to rural Africa, you know? So you gotta be smart about those things, but you wouldn't go to rural Africa the week after you had a heart attack either. So I think that for people who are doing well, living with CLL that aren't needing some sort of, you know, a situation where they need a lot of medical visits and care right now, definitely travel. And then, you know, yes, you can get infections when you travel, but you can get infections, you know, in your own neighborhood. And, uh, you know, I don't think that keeping yourself only in your neighborhood or where you live is really going to help you live any better. Uh, you do have to be kind of smart about it. So if you're going to go somewhere where there's malaria, go to a travel clinic, you know, make sure that you take the advice of the travel clinic. If, you know, if you're going to Houston, you probably don't need to do anything special. If you're going like Central America, then you might want to go to a travel clinic. And as you know, most people with CLL were instructed to avoid live vaccines. So you have to tell the travel clinic, you know, I'm going X place. What are the recommendations? I'm not supposed to get live vaccines. Um, sometimes they can recommend low doses of antibiotics to avoid this. They have practical ways to avoid it, you know, for like ticks, if you tuck your pants, you know, your socks into, or your pants into your socks. So being cautious and taking care not to get infections is good advice, but I don't think it really helps people to limit their travel. Okay. That makes yeah. sense? Yeah, I mean, if someone got a stem cell transplant or something, that's a different category. I'm talking about most people living with CLL. Sure, sure. Well, you mentioned the problem with live vaccines and patients with CLL. Should patients with CLL get a flu shot or vaccines? Because we hear from some patients, they say they shouldn't. Yeah, so um, because CLL is a cancer of the immune system, it makes the of immune system cells, of B lymphocytes, it makes the rest of the immune system function differently than in healthy individuals. So the benefit that people get from vaccines if they have CLL is actually less. So the if you get a flu shot, you know, it doesn't decrease your risk of getting the flu the same way it would for, you know, a, a healthy adult. However, it's still a good idea to do because people with CLL live at a higher risk of infection. And the way I view it is you should take every opportunity to decrease your risk for infection because influenza is terrible. And if you can decrease your risk even a little bit, you know, I would do it. Now, live vaccines are a bit of a debate because people who are immune compromised don't get them. So live vaccines are live virus similar to the one that you're being vaccinated against. So examples of live vaccine are the oral typhoid vaccine, the MMR vaccine. I know we're having measles outbreak in some parts of the country, so MMR is kind of off the table. Um, there is an intranasal flu vaccine that's live. It's very hard to get these days and uncommon to be offered. So I recommend that people get all the vaccines they're due and as long as they're killed vaccines. There is now a new shingles vaccine called Shingrix, which is a killed vaccine. I've had many patients get that. Um, you know, we're not sure how well it works in CLL, probably not as well as in healthy adults, but it is safe. So if you can get your hands on it, it's, it's been on shortage. There's no reason not to get these things. Um, I do think for people that have had really severe vaccine reactions, that's always an individual conversation with your doctor. Yeah, yeah, sounds like it. How about this one? I'm not experiencing symptoms, so I don't need treatment. Uh, that may or may not be true. So in some cases, you know, like, uh, especially if people are in monitoring or observation for their CLL, the goal is to start treatment before you get horribly sick, right? So in some cases, you'll see that the changes in the blood really predict that someone's going to start to be really sick from CLL in the next few months. Like you might see their platelet count is going down or their hemoglobin's going down a lot. And so there's kind of a level, so it's a platelet kind of 100 and hemoglobin of like 10 or 11 where you think about treatment and it's not like, oh, you hit this level, 
you need to do treatment tomorrow, you know, but it's time to plan a treatment. Also, that is the one group of CLL patients where a bone marrow biopsy is really needed to make sure that the decrease in blood counts is CLL and not something else. But most of those people feel fine, but if your platelet count is headed down, it's probably best to start treatment before your platelet count is, you know, below 10 and you start having bleeding symptoms. You know, so there are some people who are recommended to take treatment for CLL because their doctor has noticed that they're gonna be at risk for developing problems or symptoms that might make them feel much less well. And so you wanna start the treatment when you're still feeling good and before you're having a lot of bleeding and issues. Um, however, the majority of people who don't have symptoms, uh, you know, don't need treatment for it. Uh, quite a while ago, they did randomize people with intermediate or high-risk CLL to either chemotherapy at diagnosis or delayed until they had one of those treatment indications I've been talking about. And treating it with chemotherapy just because you have diagnosed it did not help people live longer or better. So if people are not having symptoms and their doctor doesn't know there's a problem, there's no reason to treat it. We talked a little bit how diet and exercise can help with symptoms, but can they control symptoms? Tricky uh, question. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think that's really individual. The thing I get asked all the time is what diet can I go on to make my CLO go away or so that I never need treatment? Mm -hmm. And there are no evidence-based diets to make your CLO go away. Coffee enema thing, doesn't work. Uh, no sugar thing, I'm not sure that works. Um, I do tell my patients to try to eat and behave as if they're going to be around a long time because people with CLL usually expect to live many, many years and heart disease still killing people in this country. So you can't like stop managing your diabetes, you know, you can't start eating hamburgers when you have horrible heart disease. So I think you still have to follow a regular healthy adult diet. Most people feel better if they eat fruits and vegetables and try to eat, you know, a well-balanced adult diet. So I think that helps pretty much everyone, even healthy adults, but I don't know of any specific diet to control CLL symptoms. Although I did have one guy that said ever since he's been eating white toast every morning, all his symptoms are much better. And so I think if you find something that works for you, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's working out for you, you should do it.